why so many churches? I've already mentioned the reason for two of them, the Catholic orders. We had Dominicans, we had Franciscans, we had a Cistercian nunnery just outside the town wall. Franciscans were thrown out during the Reformation, also the Cistercians and the Dominicans. Not many people go to church anymore. When I give guided tours to school groups, I usually do an experiment which is quite interesting. I have a theory, I think it's very, it's quite easy for people to leave relig religious beliefs from one generation to another. But it's much more difficult to leave tradition because you want to do the same thing as your forefathers did. And when I ask school children when I have guided tours, how many of you would say that you are a Christian, you go regularly to church and so on? Almost no one raises their hand. And then I ask them, who many of you would be interested to get married in a church before a priest? Everyone. Who among you would be uh, willingly to, to, to baptize your child in a church? with the priest, everyone. Because we have the tradition, we want to do the same thing as our forefathers, but we don't have the belief. We do things because we have always done it, but we don't know why. Perfect introduction for the Gotland Forum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> did, 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 you, did you register? Did oh, yeah. you okay. mm -hmm. I did. That's amazing. Good. <laughs> Gotland is quite an amazing place. There is a walled city. The old island, it's full of churches. It shows the incredible flourishment of Christianity in the Middle Ages. So Gotland Island was the best place to start this forum. Ulf Silverling, the founder of uh, EW3N in Sweden, and me, we had lively discussions. And we figured out that there is an enormous crisis in our Christianity in Northern Europe, and that young people are longing for something that is tradition, that is authentic. So we want to help them discover their true ancestors. The Vikings and the Rangians, the Northern Europeans, as they really were, and as they really became when they were uh, became Christians. In the Middle Ages, the common pattern of Christianization was that it was imposed by the rulers. A ruler would adopt uh, Christianity and then would introduce it to his people. At the same time, Gotland was rather an exception. It became really a people's faith uh, from the beginning through trade routes, through interactions between different peoples and, and areas. And I should remind that an important input to the Christianization of Gotland was made by a version of Christianity, which is known as Eastern Christianity, which was, well, Byzantine Christianity, which we now call Orthodoxy. So in this sense, uh, Gotland became really an ecumenical place where West and East met together. At that time, of course, West and East constituted one thing. It, there was no separation, there was no division yet. But certainly, there were cultural differences, and those cultural dif differences mixed up in Gotland. And when, when we visited places, churches, really m numerous churches here on the island, on this relatively small piece of land with around 100 churches, we saw how this mixture happened. It's a cross-shaped church, and we see that mostly in the eastern part of the Christian world. So for many, many years, we believed that this is one of the Russian churches in Isby. But written sources tell us there were actually two churches, but it's a very difficult document to rely on. And the reason for that is when that document was written in the 15th century, Visby and Novgorod wasn't friends anymore. But if we look at how this church was built, it could probably have been started by the Russians, but quite soon afterwards been taken over. What time? By, 
What century? This church was built in the beginning of the 13th century. In Northern Europe itself, in Scandinavia, there is a spiritual crisis because it's a very secularized society. We had, of course, Cardinal uh, Anders from Stockholm, who is the bishop, and he's actually the first Scandinavian cardinal ever. Your Eminence, there's a lot of young people living in noisy cities and having big, big trouble in trying to find silence. How would you recommend, how can they reconquer that? I think the first thing is to realize that there is silence within ourselves. That this is a sacred temple where the Trinity lives, thanks to baptism, where there is always adoration and silence, even if on the surface there is noise. Because it's very hard to find a place without any noise whatsoever. But if we accept that inside, deep inside, there is always an interior space with silent adoration. Then you have conquered, then you have received the message. Of course, you have to return to that silence over and over again. But if you can be overwhelmed by the insight of God's mercy, that he is always there, that there is always possibility to withdraw to this interior sanctuary within yourselves, then you don't mind so much if there is noise around you. It's very important if we want to really rediscover the transcendent, the vertical nature of our Christian faith. Christ is the Son of God. He is God. We have to return to that very basic instinct of man. He wants to adore. He has to deal with death. So he has to retrace in some way or another an almighty God that he can really trust. The last church we're going to visit is a church built in the 1980s, which might seem strange. But of course, I want to tell you about our beautiful Catholic church today. <laughs> A very small group of Catholics that lived in Visby rented a small medieval basement, uh, which was a Catholic chapel. But now the congregation had grown and they needed a, ch a church of their own. And I think that's beautiful that they could use all these elements and make it parts of the church. The room we're standing in down here is the first parts of the church was built. And then, uh, 20 years ago, that part was built. And the relic I'm talking about is in this small cabinet. And it's a small drop of blood from the robe, the habit that St. John Paul wore when he was shot at St. Peter's Square. And after his death and his sainthood, they cut small pieces of the robe and selected churches all over the world. And one of these churches that was selected was this small, small church in this place. And I think it's so amazing that world history has moved into this small church of Corpus Christi in this place. what was spoken tonight was human beings we have this instinct for religion for faith it doesn't matter if you don't believe in christianity or or in islam or buddhism you 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 will find your god whether that's through money or sex or drugs or anything else that's expedient for lack of a better word um, i think we have to ground ourselves in something concrete and so having this broad range of guests, it touched on my newfound Catholic faith. I lived for about 20 years actively rejecting God and his teachings. And it was during a, a really low moment in my life where I started hearing people speak about the importance of 
Judeo-Christian values in, in our society, even, even as me an atheist, where I could then appreciate Christian teachings and realize how important it is in society that we at least live as Christians. I owe it to myself to explore why I was having these feelings, and so through a lot of prayer and a lot of talk with, with some friends, now there's, there's no way of denying it. I've, I've experienced life with God and just having my own, my own personal miracles. <laughs> there's no going back after this.